Another one of the most common questions I get regarding the C55 right alongside what is my list of modifications that I've done to the car is what has been my overall reliability and ownership experience with having this car. I've had this car for almost eight years now and put a little over 30,000 miles on it. So I have a pretty good idea of what the overall ownership experience is, especially since I've owned the car into the 100,000 plus mile range. So I've kind of had to experience some of the common uh, reliability things that have come up with this car. Um, but I did do a video on this topic a few years ago, but since then a few more things have come up, so I wanted to do an update video to cover those things. But my overall message with the reliability of the C55 is that it is a great first AMG for anybody to get into. My plan for this video is to start by talking about all the reliability things that have come up, up with this car. So basically all the maintenance items that are that fall outside of routine maintenance that have caused me to either get stranded on the side of the road or just uh, things that aren't routine per se with maintenance. And then after I cover those things, which it is a relatively short list, after I cover those things, uh, I'm gonna talk about just overall ownership experience with this car in general to help try and give anybody an idea that's looking into possibly buying one of these a better idea of what they're getting into. Now the first item on the issue list that I've uh, had come up with the car while owning it was very early on in owning the car and I want to start by saying that I purchased this car back in September of 2012 with 86,000 miles on it and currently it has uh, almost 119,000 miles on it so a little over 30,000 miles um, but the first thing that came up with the car is very early on um, it was a very simple thing but and I don't even remember too much about it because it was so early on but I wanted to make sure I covered it was I, I believe I got a check engine light for some kind of fuel pressure sensor or something like that um, just because I was very early on in owning the car I ended up just taking it to the dealer to have that fixed um, but yeah just a check engine light for I believe some kind of fuel pressure sensor um, took it in I believe it was like 200 bucks to replace it or something like that and then um, it was good to go after that. The next item on the issue list has is kind of been, uh, it's happened once, I had it done, and then it happened again, so it's kind of ongoing, and it's currently, it's not a huge problem right now, but it is something that needs to be addressed at some point, are leaky valve cover gaskets. And I covered this in the last reliability uh, video, um, the valve cover gaskets, I don't know if it's just a weird design, but they are known, I mean all valve cover gaskets leak on all kinds of cars, but uh, I believe these, I don't know, it's just because the way they're built, they are known to leak a little bit and because of the way they're positioned, you know, on most cars anyways, you're going to get a little bit of oil burning off on the headers um, because of that. So it's not a big problem with this car, there's just a small oil leak from both banks, so basically if the car sits for a while, um, you know, oil kind of accumulates a little bit from the, the leak leak on the, the gasket and then when you first start the car in a long time it kind of burns it off so you get a little bit of an oil burning smell but after it warms up it goes away and then if you're consistently driving the car I never really notice it anyways. Another thing I want to mention before diving more into this video is like I mentioned I bought this car in September 2012 and it had 86,000 miles on it. And since then, I put about 30,000 miles on it. So um, I haven't daily driven it every year of ownership that I've had it. I've, da I've daily driven it for about two and a half years of ownership. Other than that, it was kind of like a weekend fun car because I had a Nissan Altima that I drove for daily driving. Next item on the issue list was also very early on in owning the car. And really, it's not particular to this car. It you know, can happen to any car with age and whatnot, especially depending on the climate you live in, if it's hot and dry. Was I had to deal with some um, broken and brittle vacuum hoses um, underneath the air box. So I had to get those swapped out, um, but pretty simple, nothing crazy, but I did want to mention that as well. The next item on the issue list actually didn't happen until about five to six years into owning the car and, and when it had about 112,000 miles on it. And I did do a whole video on this issue, but it was related to the conductor plate in the transmission, getting a check engine light for an input turbine shaft speed sensor that basically put the car into limp mode and uh, I couldn't drive it on the freeways or really drive it at all. But like I said, it did do a whole video on this topic um, and the issue with the conductor plate is not singled out to just the C55. That issue can happen to any Mercedes with the 722.6 transmission, which is just their basic five-speed shiftable um, transmission that they started using, I believe, in the late 90s all the way up to about 2010, somewhere around there. 
Um, basically what happened was I got a check engine light for that speed sensor, put the car into limp mode. Um, it happened to me, um, like I said, I'm, I'm not going to go too in depth with uh, what exactly happened because I have a whole separate video on it, but it started showing some minor symptoms early on and then they started to get progressively worse and then I got stranded actually while coming home from uh, a grad school one day so I had to get the car towed home. Um, and I replaced that whole thing myself. I believe the kit for parts and everything was about $400. I can't remember exactly, but if you're able to do it yourself, it really wasn't hard. I did it in one day. You'll save yourself probably almost $1,000 in labor. Um, but the conductor plate is a very common thing. It's just basically an electronic circuit board that uh, uh, contacts, or it basically translates the signals from the TCM and then controls the solenoids in the valve body of the transmission on when to send fluid into what chambers to switch gears and something like that. Um, so that is a very common failure point on this car um, that I had to fix. Um, but basically once you fix it and make sure you use a genuine OEM replacement part, it should be good to go for the rest of the life of the transmission at least. But overall the procedure for replacing and fixing that conductor plate issue was not too hard and with a little bit of research and some basic knowledge of you know obviously how to wrench on cars, anybody can pretty much do it. I had no idea how to solve this or repair this issue when it first happened, but through some basic Google searching and YouTube video watching, um, I was able to figure out what parts I needed, what tools I needed, and what the procedure was to replace this part. I basically did that, you know, you drain the fluid and everything and you get a transmission fluid change while you do it. So it's not too hard overall, but if you want more details on that, you can check out my other video on it. So, but that's one of the main issues um, that comes up with these transmissions in these cars. Other than that, the 722.6 transmission is one of the most bulletproof transmissions that I believe Mercedes has made in the last, you know, 30, 40 years. It's, it's known for its reliability. Now the next issue I had with this car happened right around the same time as the uh, conductor plate issue about five to six years into owning the car and it was related to the alternator, in particular the voltage regulator on the back of the alternator. Now how it started was one day I noticed a battery alternator uh, error visit workshop message on the dash in red. Um, and so, I, okay, I thought that maybe the car sat a little bit too long, so the battery was below a certain voltage. So it just needed to get driven and charged a little bit so it didn't trigger that message. But as I was driving the car more and more that day, I noticed a you know subtle kind of like burning electrical smell, um, especially as, as I sat at a stoplight. So that's obviously not something you want to be smelling in your car. And as the day went on and as I drove the car more, um, trying to figure out what it was, the smell got worse and worse. And I just I pulled it in one day, opened the hood, and I think the rush of air into the engine bay actually sparked the small electrical fire um, in the voltage regulator area on the back of the alternator. So moral of the story is I had to replace the alternator um, because it was something happened and short circuited there in the electronics area of the alternator. Um, and that job of replacing the alternator on this car was way more painful than the conductor plate. I think that was one of the most painful things that I've had to do on this car as far as um, you know it taking a while and being a pain in the butt um, basically <clears throat> this car is the engine the v8 in this car is kind of crammed in there now this car is extended about six inches from the standard c class to kind of help better fit the larger v8 um, that's put in the c55 only um, even even though they did extend it a little bit it is still very tight in there so it's really difficult to get the alternator out without pulling the whole fan shroud off of the radiator. So what I actually had to do was I had to take the alternator apart into two pieces to get it out of the engine bay and take the new one apart into two pieces, put it in piece by piece, and then put it together, mount it, everything like that. So once I replaced that, it really wasn't an issue except um, I did have an issue with the voltage regulator on that replacement alternator. So this next issue is very much related to the, you know, first issue with the alternator. What happened was is the second voltage regulator went bad and it wasn't charging the battery and so I had to replace the voltage regulator. Now I did get the replacement alternator from O'Reilly's and they told me it was a remanufactured OEM Bosch alternator. Which it turned out it was a Bosch alternator but the voltage regulator which is a little plastic piece on the back was a cheap Chinese voltage regulator not the one from Bosch. So I had a little issue with that. It, you know, the, the brushes for the voltage regulator actually fell out and broke off. So I had to um, replace that. 
and I did do another video on that too. Basically, I was able to go underneath the car without taking the whole uh, alternator out and replace the voltage regulator from behind with a genuine OEM Bosch one um, that I made sure I got uh, from FCP Euro. Now, since replacing the voltage regulator with a genuine OEM Bosch part, I haven't had any issues with that. It's been a great running alternator. It charges the battery, kept it charged, and it's been going good so far. The next issue I had has also been kind of throughout the life of owning the car, but within the past uh, few years or so, it hasn't been an issue. And I did do a whole nother video on this topic as well and that was regarding uh, the motor oil burning issue. Now, it is a common thing with these uh, M113 and I believe M113K engines that the stock OW40, they are known for burning off some of the oil. It is a performance engine, so I know some performance engines do burn oil, especially if you drive them in a more spirited manner at high RPMs. But basically, I was having to put in about a quart of oil every two to 3,000 2,000 miles or every two months depending on how much I drove the car um, and so for a while I was just using the standard mobile one OW40 and I did some researching and found on the forums that a lot of people switched to 5W40 to help increase the cold uh, viscosity so you didn't have that burning issue um, and I switched to that and I haven't had any issues with oil burning um, since then now as I stated in my video that specifically talks about this topic make sure before you switch oils you do research based on the climate you live in because sometimes you do need that OW40 uh, based on your climate. Now that oil burning was very subtle that I experienced like I said it was very you know occasional it wasn't often and it wasn't severe it wasn't a lot of oil. Um, now if you're if you have this car and you're experiencing a lot of oil you're having to top off either very frequently or having to top off with a lot of oil way more than just a quart you might have a more serious problem, and I've heard from a few people um, that that might be related to the uh, valve guide seals um, on the engine that you might have to get those replaced. Um, but so far, most of the time when you talk about oil burning with these cars, it's just related to the viscosity um, at cold startups mostly. So the next issue I have with this car also happened about uh, six years into owning the car, which is kind of a common thing that I'll talk about at the end of this list. But that issue was related to the crankshaft position sensor. Now that um, was is a sneaky issue, and I did a, again a whole other video just on this topic. Um, but it came it came up on me really quickly. Kind of didn't show any signs. It left me stranded um, at a restaurant one time one morning after getting a nice uh, pancake breakfast. So I had to deal with that. Um, but basically, it was the crankshaft position sensor, and what will happen is it's just a basic uh, magnetic sensor that uh, senses the. There's a spot on the, I believe, the, the um, flywheel on the engine that it knows what is top dead center, so it's help with timing and everything like that, um, with the ignition and injectors and stuff like that. Um, but basically, that sensor will go bad. It's just a cheap, I believe, like $20 sensor, um, but it'll leave you stranded because you know the car will be driving fine, and then sometimes you know you'll start to you'll crank the car and it'll just. Da -da 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 -da. You know, it won't fire up or turn over. It won't even sputter or anything because it doesn't know where timing is on the engine. Um, so it'll come up on you quick sometimes. Sometimes it'll leave you stranded. It's a relatively easy part to replace. You do have to hop up into the back area of the engine bay up where the windshield wipers are and stick your hand down in um, that area because basically the sensor is positioned on the back end of the engine right around the transmission bell housing. So it's a little bit hard to get to, um, but if you have small hands and you have the right um, series of socket adapters and extensions and you know angles and, and whatnot, you're able to do it and it's not too bad of an issue to replace at all. Um, but again, parts really cheap, so if you have the means to do it yourself, it'll take you maybe half a day. Um, but if you have to take it in some place, it might not be that bad either because they obviously know what they're doing and I don't think it would take them all that long to replace it either. The next thing that happened with this car has been really recent. I did a video about this just a few videos ago and a, it was related to the battery being drained, a parasitic drain um, related to either the seat control modules or the command um, interior climate fan. Now, it is a known problem with the seat control modules on this car. Either the passenger or the driver seat control module won't shut off after the sequence of everything shutting off after the ignition is off and the doors are shut. Those will continue to drain the battery. Um, 
and either that or the fan in the upper head unit area where the um, you know mirror is and your overhead map lights there's a fan in there that actually blows air into a thermistor to tell the interior temperature for the auto climate control and that fan will also stay on and actually drain the battery pretty quickly as well so what i had to do with that was um, i unplugged the seat modules and I plugged them back in and it hasn't been an issue but basically for the command fan thing I plug, unplugged a fuse and that has solved the issue so um, I haven't gotten into actually replacing that panel yet um, but that has solved the issue so far um, with the parasitic drain and other than that it's been fine. Now the last like mechanical thing I've had with this car was the uh, kind of like I don't know, it's borderline mechanical, but it was the rear sunshade, and it's a problem with across a lot of this, this generation of uh, C-Class Mercedes and possibly others. But basically, this car has an electronic folding um, sunshade in, uh, that covers the back glass, so if you're driving and the sun's behind you, you can use that to kind of give you some more um, sun glare protection. And I don't know, something about the... Um, the actuation of that sunshade, it gets stuck sometimes. Now there's a button on the dash that you press to raise and lower it. Frankly, it got stuck on me once. I was able to kind of jiggle it loose and then it went back down. And since then I haven't touched it. It's really not a big deal. I don't really see much benefit in it, especially if you just get your rear window tinted a little bit. Now the next thing with this car is more aesthetics. Um, and it's related to the paint on the front bumper and the front part of the hood on this car. Um, and for some reason, more so with this car than any other car that I've owned, it seems like this paint on these, you know, Mercedes is very brittle um, and it, it suffers a lot more of from rock chips and because like I've had an Altima, I've had a Camry, I've had a bunch of different cars and they do get rock chips but they're not, uh, the paint doesn't seem as brittle so I don't know if it's the um, the mixture of paint that Mercedes uses or it's the special you know metallic pewter paint but that's just one thing I've noticed is this car gets a little bit more rock chips than a lot of my other cars that I've driven more than this car. Not a big deal, but just something to notice. The last item on my issue list with this car, it's again an aesthetic thing, and this one's an interior aesthetic issue, and it's um, just related to the headliner. It's starting to droop a little bit over the rear passengers where they sit. Basically, the adhesive that attaches the part of the headliner that you see to the like headliner board that mounts into the car just started to break down, probably from just the heat um, and you know driving the car and whatnot. So the headliner drooped a little bit. So as an interim fix, I just put like these little thumbtacks in. I'm you know I didn't want to have to deal with that right now. And the, that's really the main area sort of drooping was in the back. But there are a few parts in the front, like above where the uh, fold down uh, sunshades are in the front, where it started just to do it a little bit. Um, but again, minor aesthetic thing that if you took it to an upholstery shop for a few hundred bucks, they'd probably do it for you, no problem. That really wraps up my issue list that I've had with this car over the eight years of owning it. Now, granted, I only had it for, or I've only put a little over 30,000 miles on it since owning it, but owning it for eight years and having it for years on end where the car I daily drove it and then times where I didn't daily drive it and it sat for a little bit longer, I feel like I still experienced quite a bit of the range of um, owning this car and especially because a lot of the issues I had based on my research happen around the 100,000 100, plus mile range and I, you know I've the middle of owning this car is right in about that time you know a lot of these issues start popping up about 100,000, 110, 120,000 miles and like I said when going over those issues that's when a lot of them started happening so with that being said, if you plan on buying a car with lower miles before that time frame, you might have some time before you know issues start popping up. Or if you buy a car right around that time or that mile range or after, um, either make sure that they've already been done or just budget accordingly in case you have to do those. Um, and you know, really for the most part. Um, you know, there a lot of them weren't hard to do. They weren't like crazy engine out, transmission out mods or um, issues. A lot of them, you know, you could do in about a day, half a day, uh, with some basic mechanical skills. And that's the other thing um, with this car parts 
are really not too bad, especially when you have places like FCP Euro. Now, they're not a sponsor of the video, but I did get a lot of my parts from them. Um, they sell really awesome kits for this car, like the transmission uh, conductor plate kit. They sell a complete kit that has everything you need to do the job. They sell oil change kits and just other stuff. And they're all genuine OEM parts, Bosch, you know, all Mercedes OEM, and they have lifetime warranty on the parts. So with that site alone, you can get really good quality parts at an affordable price. It really makes owning this car a lot more reasonable. Like I said, if you have the basic mechanical skills to do some of these um, re repairs and replacements of these parts, it's really not too bad. And then it comes down to how much you just value your time to save on labor costs. So overall, uh, this car has been pretty economical to own, believe it or not, for being a 15-year-old German uh, Mercedes performance car. Now that I've covered all of the issues that I've had with the car, I want to just talk more about the ownership experience in general of owning this car and just some of the notes that I want to add um, for anyone that's looking at buying one of these. So again, just to reiterate, I bought this car in September of 2012, owned it till about now. Now is pretty much August 2020, so pretty much almost eight years exactly. Um, bought it with 86,000 miles on it, has almost 119,000 miles on it now. I daily drove it for about two and a half years of that time frame of owning it, and not all at once, a little bit in the beginning and a little bit towards uh, the end now. Um, and it's been a great car. It just, I've loved it. It's, it's a really fun car to own. Um, as I mentioned in some of my other videos, it's a great car to mod because you can do it in such a way that it's clean and it's not doesn't it's not too flashy, but it also will catch the eye of an enthusiast when they know what to look for in a performance German car. Um, and it's it's a car that can be an easy daily driver, you know, to run errands, go to work, go to school, um, and not be annoying to drive and comfortable and it'll also be comfortable to drive because the interior is just amazing I mean when you get the c55 you get the cool Napa leather seats they're really bolstered and they're just super comfy um, so it's a great daily driver but when you want to get on it and have some fun it just opens up and it's like a completely different car and it handles amazing now I am gonna do a driving review video after this um, to talk more about that part of it but uh, just briefly, it's been a very fun car to own and I've had a lot of fun with it taking on a bunch of different cruises to a bunch of different car shows, you name it. It's been a great car to own so far. Now, as far as uh, gas mileage goes, that's kind of a funny topic just because, you know, it's like if you're going to daily drive it, know that it is a V8 from the mid 2000s, so it doesn't get the greatest gas mileage. Um, on the freeway, the best gas mileage I've gotten is about 22 to 24. If you're just cruising, not a ton of hills, you're not getting on it. Um, so 22 to 24 there, so that's not too bad. Um, I've gotten it as low as five if I'm really romping on it in like a canyon drive and like really spirited driving, accelerating hard. So I've gotten as low as five or seven even. Um, so just note that, but overall, like combined MPG between city, freeway, and kind of spirited driving, it averages about 15 to 17, so I'd say about 16, to mi 16 miles a gallon on average. Just know this car doesn't get like as bad of MPG as like a Hummer, but it doesn't get the greatest MPG even to modern V8 standards because they have cylinder deactivation and all sorts of crazy new technology to help with gas mileage. So if you're buying this car, just keep in mind it doesn't have the greatest gas mileage, but it is a performance V8 uh, AMG Mercedes. So hopefully that's not your first concern when looking at a car like this. And obviously being a Mercedes and especially being an AMG, it's gonna require premium gas. So for in California, we've got 91, that's the best we get. So just consider also that you're gonna have to be putting the uh, a little bit more pricey gas in when you're owning this car as well. Now, ownership experience, like I said, this car, you know, you heard my list of issues over owning this car. It's been, it was really short, and frankly, I take that a lot to the drivetrain in this car. Now, the M113 engine and the 722.6 transmission, in my opinion, is one of the most reliable and best built drivetrains that Mercedes has put in a car uh, in the last 20 years. It's been a, it's a great engine that, you know, it's got a lot of support on the forums, a lot of parts readily available. And that's the other thing is 
Parts for this engine are shared with other non-AMG uh, engines, so like the E500 or 550 engines, um, you know, and some of the, even the V6s, they're all similar in design. So a lot of the parts can be shared with each other. So um, a lot of questions I get asked are, you know, is there an AMG tax? And to some degree, yes. Um, for certain parts that are specific to this model, the C55, you are gonna see a little bit more of a price increase on that part. But because a lot of the parts are shared, like the alternator I'm pretty sure is shared, and a lot of the other components like the crankshaft position sensor, that's a common part, they're all shared. So you're not gonna see much of a difference between a standard C-Class part and a C55 part. They're all about the same price because the engines are all relatively similar in design. So just moral of the story, it's a great drivetrain, very reliable, it makes a great amount of, a good amount of power that's not boring, but it's not crazy amounts where it'll get you in tons of trouble on the street. It's a really good usable amount of power for the street and the car just makes an awesome sound, especially when you mod the exhaust a little bit. So talking about that, you know, and getting to like kind of the moral of the story of this video is that it is a great first AMG for anybody to look at. If you're looking at getting into like the performance German car um, market or area of the car industry, the C55 is kind of an often overlooked car um, when compared to like the M3 and the Audi like S4 and stuff like that. They didn't make a ton of these. They actually only, between 2005 and 2006, they only made this car for two years. They imported only about 1,200 into the US. And so figure, you know, how many have been wrecked and whatnot since then, there's, a, there's less than that now. So, you know, it's a pretty rare car too. So sometimes people don't know what it is. So if you're looking for a car that's kind of a sleeper, it's a pretty cool option. But it's a great first AMG. The parts are pretty affordable. The maintenance isn't horrible by any means compared to some other um, German cars, <coughs> BMW and Audi. Um, but, you know, it's just, I might be a little bit biased, but I think these cars are just a lot more reliable to, them, to their competitors of this era. They're just really well built. They feel very safe. It feels like a very safe and planted car that's just structurally sound when you're driving it compared to like a Nissan Sentra. You know, it just feels really safe when driving it. Um, and it's a great first AMG. Uh, the other thing too that I always tell people when talking about this car as like in, from an ownership uh, side of things is it's a pretty simple car. Um, I mean, it does have a lot of like the computer modules that you know can possibly go bad over time, but it doesn't have like the crazy ABC aromatic suspension like a lot of the other Mercedes. It doesn't have a lot of crazy sensors, you know, and weird stuff. Um, you know, it's a pretty basic car that's just, in my opinion, about performance. You got the bigger engine in there, you got the bigger brakes, tune suspension, stuff like that. So it's, it really just comes down to the performance, you know, fun that you have with this car without having a lot of the, you know, nitty gritty bells and whistles that go bad over time. Because that's another thing with, you know, the E55s and the higher up Mercedes model ranges is that when the more fancy things that they have, the more likely or the more things that there are to go wrong. So that's why I really like this car, is it's simple, it's pretty easy to work on, minus the fact that the engine bay is a little bit cramped. It's really not a hard car to work on, and it's pretty straightforward. And also, just as the car in general, that I'll talk about more in the driving review, but it's a short wheelbase car compared to the other Mercedes, so it's really agile and fun to drive. Um, in autocross and like spirited canyon drives. That's pretty much gonna sum up my reliability and ownership overview of this car. Like I said, it's been a great car to own. Had it for almost eight years now. It's been so much fun to take on so many different cruises, different car shows, and just do tons of awesome stuff with. It's a really fun car when you want it to be. When you want it to be a tamed daily driver, it can do that as well. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword in a good sense that it can be a tamed daily driver while also being a fun weekend car at the same time. So that pretty much wraps up my reliability and ownership uh, review of this car. If you guys have any questions about this car at all, I'm always happy to answer them in the comments section. So if you're looking at buying one of these, just know that I do highly recommend it. Just make sure you do your research um, when looking at the car. If the car has maintenance records, make sure that you, you know, look at those and see what work has been done. 
and basically all those things um, to look for that I mentioned, you want to make sure that those have been done. Um, you know, if the car is around 100,000 miles or more, because um, then you might save yourself some headaches of having to do those yourself. Um, or pay someone else to do it. Now I'm sure there's other things that uh, you know I left out that come up with these cars that I might not have mentioned. One of them is being you know the rear main seal sometimes will leak but it's a common issue with a lot of cars not just this car in particular. So if you know one of those and I left it out just comment it below and that might really help someone out. Um, but what the one thing that I always recommend to anyone who's looking at buying one of these cars regardless of you know your knowledge of cars one thing I always do myself and recommend to others is just get a pre-purchase inspection done and have that set up before you buy the car. Take it to a mechanic that you know and trust um, because they have a good eye for things that you might miss because they're obviously doing that every day and they have a lift too so that they can get underneath the car and see any things that you might not see just from looking at it from this point of view or from the top of the engine bay. Because um, you know the big thing is you just want to look for oil leaks or just any kind of leaks in general. You know. Uh, the thing with the conductor plate, the one thing I didn't mention is there's a plug that the TCM connects into. Sometimes that'll leak transmission fluid. So, you you know, just like any other car, you want to look for leaks, stuff like that, weird sounds, you know, anything like that. But just get a pre-purchase pre inspection done and you should be pretty safe. So if you get a pre-purchase inspection, you'll kind of know what to expect if there's either things that if the car checks out and it's good to go, you'll feel reassured about that, paying maybe a little bit more for the purchase price, or if there's things that need to be done, you can use that as leverage to negotiate the price accordingly, knowing that you might have to do those maintenance things. Um, but yeah, I mean, leaks and just weird sounds while the car is running and while it's driving, you know, you want to make sure that the transmission shifts smoothly because one thing with the conductor plate issue was that the transmission started to shift hard, um, especially when you go from park to drive, it'll kind of clunk into gear. Um, so when you're driving it, again, listen for weird uh, noises and you know, make sure the transmission shifts smoothly, you know, in all the gears and whatnot, and you should be good to go. But overall, I just can't say enough about this car. It's been a really great car to own, really fun car to drive. Um, you know, I went to prom in this thing. I, you know, uh, left my wedding in this car. You know, it's it's just I've had a lot of good memories in this car. So, without rambling on too much more, I hope you guys enjoyed this video as always. And again, if you have any comments or questions about this car, you're looking to buy one, um, feel free to leave them below, and I'll be happy to answer them because I just love sharing information that I've learned about this car over the years of owning it. So thank you all so much for watching, and other than that, I will see you guys in the next one.